Hello. So we're working on lecture 16 today. We're going to do more with hash tables and talk about collision resolution and how to deal with that. So the idea of putting things in a hash table is great. We get hopefully an O of 1 lookup time. The problem is that there's generally going to be collisions. We can't in the general case prevent all of them. So we want to have a fast insert search removal and we want to have it work still pretty well in the case where multiple keys get hashed to the same table index. And there's four methods that we're going to talk about today. Separate chaining, linear probing, quadratic probing, and double hashing. And three of these are referred to collectively as the category called open addressing. Separate chaining is going to be different from all of the open addressing methods. Okay, so separate chaining, the idea is instead of just having a table with entries, we have a table and the table has linked lists in it. And then when we put something in a table index, if there's something else there, we just add the new item to the linked list. And our sort of real world example here is that uh, if you're going grocery shopping, and let's assume that you go to the same store fairly often, when you want to find a particular item, like a can of soup, you know which aisle the soup is in. So you go to the can of soup, you go to the aisle that has soup in it, and you know which side it's on about how far down. So you get you get to where the soup is really quickly. But then to find a particular soup, you don't know it that well, so you've got to look. And I'm, you know, I'm looking across the different cans looking for the particular type of soup that I want to eat today. So we quickly hash to the right place in the store, but then we have, because all of the things that have the key soup all hash to the same section, we have to go through all of the different soups to find what we're looking for. So the idea here is that we want to reduce the number of comparisons. Instead of doing like one linked list where we'd have to sequential search the whole thing, we want to split it up into M linked lists and hopefully on average our keys will get split evenly across the M different linked lists. And so if we've got a table with M linked lists and N keys, and let's say, let's say, uh, let's just add a word here, unique. So we, we have, let's assume we have N unique keys, then the probability that the number of keys within each linked list is within a constant uh, factor of N divided by M is a pretty good chance if we've got a good hash function. So if the hash function does a decent job of splitting the keys to across different indices, then we should have about, on average, n divided by m items per linked list. Now, even if it's terrible, we will have an average of n divided by m. We would have 0, 0, 0, 0, all n items, 0, 0, 0, 0. So granted, the average is always going to be n over m, but we want the, we'd like to have the median be n divided by m or close to it. No, see, medium would still be bad. So their medium would be zero. And medium would be zero, the maximum would be n. So yeah, it'd still be bad. So we'd like to, we'd like to divide them up evenly. So we've got this number called the load factor. This number alpha is m divided by m. So when we do this separate chaining, when we put things in the linked lists, then alpha is the average number of items per linked list. And it could be greater than one. You know, I could have a hash table of size 10 and have 20 items in the hash table because if the hash function's good, I've got about two per linked list. And that's still pretty, pretty good to divide them up instead of having to check 10 items or 20 items to find what I'm looking for, I on average have to look at two. So that's not too bad. 
Um, with open addressing. Now, with open addressing, we, I know we haven't talked about this yet, but we're, we're talking about alpha, so we've got a little chicken and egg problem here. So when we do open addressing, let's just say we don't have the linked list. We just have the table. So if we just have the table, then alpha would tell us what percentage of the table indices are occupied, and in that case, alpha would have to be less than or equal to 1. If it's got to go somewhere in the table, then we can't have a load factor greater than 1. If it can be hanging off in a linked list, then we could have a load factor greater than 1. So in separate chaining, we will get insert. We would get uh, O of 1 time if we allow duplicate keys, O of alpha time if not. So if we allow duplicate keys, I just have to say, hey, I got to the right linked list. Add this new node to the linked list, whatever is the fastest way either at the head, at the tail, I don't care, whatever's O of 1, make it happen, if I allow duplicate keys. But if we don't allow duplicate keys, then it would take us O of alpha. Remember, alpha is the length of that linked list. So I would have to go through those alpha elements to decide, hey, is this key already in there? Because if it's already in there, I can't insert a new one. Maybe I can update the value associated with this value, but I can't add a new item with this key. Um, with search, search the time would be proportional to alpha. Whether we allow duplicates or not, I still might have to look through the whole list. And removal depends on search. I can't remove it if I can't search for it first. So we want the removal to be also O of alpha. So we'd like to choose M proportional to N. Maybe not exactly the same, but on the order of. We don't want them divided. We don't want them to be like n squared would be terrible, right? Sure, I don't have to search n squared items. I only have to search n items, but that doesn't give us our O of 1 that we'd like to have. So if I've got lots of items, I would like to, um, if I had, or I should, I should say, if, if n was equal to m squared would be a better way to say it. So if n was equal to m squared, then we'd get O of n, and I, I still don't like that. So we'd like to choose m proportional to n. The, the number of buckets, we'd like it to be portion, proportional to the number of items in the table. And you might say, well, wait a minute, what about linked lists? You know, didn't you tell us that linked lists are bad, that we, we seldom use them in 281? Well, we're presenting you with the classical view of a linked list. The class, or sorry, the classic view of a hash table is if you do separate chaining, the word chaining is in there because it means like it's hanging off a chain of, of pointers. So we could, we could use something other than linked list. We could use vectors instead of linked lists, but then we'd still have to search through O of alpha items to know if something's in there or not. Well, we could say, well, what if we keep that vector sorted? Well, then search would be O of alpha, uh, actually O of log alpha. So search would be O of log alpha, um, but insert and removal would still be O of alpha because I, even if though I find the spot quickly, I might have to move people over to make room for the new one or move people back to take up space when I remove one. So we could get log alpha search, we could get O of alpha uh, insert and removal, which would be a slight in improvement. We could say, well, why go that way? Why not do binary search trees? Well, if we do binary search trees, I know we haven't covered them yet. We can do it soon. We're going to start that in, uh, tomorrow. So we're, we could do binary search trees. So then we could get O of log alpha for insert and search and remove, as long as it's a tree and not a stick. Because if it's a stick, we could always get a, a bad case where it's a stick. Uh, but we get memory overhead there. The linked list has one pointer per item. The, the binary search trees have two pointers for every item. So we increase our amount of memory overhead. We could, when we learn about uh, binary search trees, we're going to teach you self-balancing binary search trees, which would mean it's never a stick. But then again, we would still need, we would actually need a little more data. We'd have not only two pointers for every node, we'd have another piece of data for every node. So we can 
speed up the worst case, but really what we'd rather have is we'd rather have a good hash function that keeps us from being in the worst case too often and maybe grow the hash table when we need to. Now, open addressing. So we're going to talk about, actually, before we do open addressing, let me take a slight detour here. We've got a demo that's on uh, Canvas in the uh, files uh, sample code folder. And I don't remember, because Professor Darden updated the slides, I don't remember if he's got a place where he calls out the uh, example in here. I'm trying to check really quick. Yeah, I'm loading up the slides in PowerPoint on my PC to search for the word. Oh, okay, yep, it, okay, so he's got it. He's got it near the end. Okay, so we'll come back to that one. We'll come back to that one and take a look at it. All right, so we've got, so we'll talk about open addressing first, and then we'll do the demo uh, of code that has a link list for separate chain later on. So with open addressing, we always have to put it somewhere in the table. And so and the, another example here is, say you're going to go to the store to buy some soup, but before you get to your hashing of which soup aisle and your separate chaining, you have to park. So you pick uh, a place to start. You say, hey, that, that, uh, that lane of the parking lot over there looks like it's got some open spots. I'm going to hash myself to there. And then you go to the very first spot, and if it was open, you would take it. And if it was full, you would skip to the next one. If that was full, you'd skip to the next one. You'd eventually get to one that's empty because you saw there were some open spots there. So this is kind of like separate chain or like like open addressing. We find where we want to hash to, but if the place we want to hash to is full, we move over by one. And if that one's full, we move over by one. And if there are open spots, we'll eventually find one. Hopefully. It doesn't take too long to find an open one. Now there's also an issue of deletions, and we're going to talk about this later. So I remember that I parked in this lane of the parking lot and the fourth spot down. Or was where I was where or sorry, the first spot was where I wanted to go. I can't remember if I ended up in the third or fourth, but I remember obviously when I got to that lane, I wanted to park in the first spot. And I get there. And there's no car there. Now, my immediate reaction is not, my car has been stolen. My immediate reaction is, oh, I, I probably parked a few spots down. It probably wasn't the first one. Probably the first one wasn't open. I had to move down a few. So we don't stop looking just because we found an empty spot. Because that, that's like a deletion, right? When I tried to park in that first spot, there was another car there. So I moved down, moved down. I found an open spot. And then while I was in the store, somebody removed the one from the first spot. So when I come back, my hash function says start here. Just because there's no car there doesn't mean my car is gone. It means, oh, I should look a little bit further down. Let's, let's follow the open addressing scheme of look at the next spot, look at the next spot. So that's the idea of open addressing, is we've got to go into the, the parking lot. We go to the lane that we want quickly, and then we find the first open spot uh, adjacent to it. And then when we come back, we do the same algorithm over again. So that's sort of our analogy for open addressing. Now, when we look at doing this, there's a term called probing. What it means is I'm checking a location by index in the hash table. So probing could be the start of, you know, I did the hash, I did the um, hash function, I did modulo the table size, and it said go here. So I go to that index. And I look, I have to see, hey, is that spot empty? Is it the one that I'm looking for? Hit means the, the key matches, like, is that my car? Or is it full, meaning, is there some other car there that is not mine, but makes me want to look further on to find my car? So these are the possible results. There's nothing there my car is there, or there's some other car there. So those are our three results. Is it empty, a hit, or full? So then if the probe results in full, that's not the car I'm looking for, then we probe at a next higher cell. And we're like I said, we're going to look at three different algorithms that do open addressing, and they all pick the next higher one in a slightly different way. 
So that's why it's in quote marks here. So we will, ch we will check whatever the algorithm says for the next one until we end our search. Either we found an open, we found an, an empty spot, which might be good because that means, hey, I can park here. Or, oh, wow, I didn't park in this lane at all. Well, our analogy does, isn't perfect. So when we're trying to insert, we want to find an empty one. We want to say, hey, I can put it there. When we're searching for something, we usually want to get a hit. We usually want to find the key we're looking for. Okay, so linear probing, our first of our three open addressing schemes. Linear probing says you use your hash function, and then you just look at sequential indices until we either find the key we're looking for or we found, find an open address, an, an empty one. So we take our translation of our key, we do our modular table size, and that gives us an index. And then if that one's full, we just keep trying t of, k, t of key plus j modulo m for j equals one, two, three, etc. You could also think of this as, hey, I just do this starting at j equals zero. We start it, and that's where I look. I look at t of k, t of the key, modulo m. t of the key mod plus zero, modulo m is the same thing. So we look there, and if we don't find what we wanted, we look at the next one. And if we, if we accidentally end up near the end, and we're still looking, we would wrap around to the beginning. We want to make sure we don't step off the end and get an invalid index. Now, the problem is things might tend to get into clusters. It's possible. Wait. Okay. I paused for a few seconds there. I saw a swirling on my, on my YouTube live preview, so I think I had a little hiccup in the Internet, so I wanted to pause there. Okay. So suppose that we're putting things in a hash table. And right now the hash table is half full. So we've got the number of items is about equal to half the size of the hash table. So if we had a hash table of size 10, the number of items in it is five. So what we wanna think about is, what does our best case distribution look like? And what does our worst case distribution look like? So we're not gonna worry about the, the complexity yet. We just wanna know what would it look like, right? What would the worst case look like? So if we had the best case, if I, if I probe and I find the key other than the one I'm looking for, I would look at the next spot. So in the best case, I would like the next spot to always be empty, right? So I'd like my hash table to be basically full, empty, full one, empty, etc. I want it to alternate. In the worst case distribution, what would happen is it's a bunch of things that are all full, 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 and the empty could be at the bottom, at the top, it could be both, like our, our cluster could be in the middle. So that's what the two distri different distributions look like. The best case would be, hey, I've been hashing and I just happened to hit every other one, and now if I, if I try to insert a new one, I either half the time I find an empty one on the first try, half the time I find some other key, but then I find an empty one on the second try. So I get right now inserting a new unique key would give me about a, an average number of probes of one and a half, either one and it's empty or it's full and then it's empty. Whereas in the one where the cluster is all together instead of, instead of like um, n separate clusters of size one, I have one cluster of size n, would be the worst case. And I say, hey, I'd like to insert a new one. Where does it hash to? It hashes here. So I check this one and then this one and this one and this one and this one before I find an empty one. Okay, so what about our cost? What about the average cost to make this happen? So if the, we already did the um, best case, in the best case, it'd be about O of one and a half, right? 
O of 1, O of 2. So it's O of 1. It's constant. But if the... So then what about this one? What's the average case when we've got the worst distribution? Well, half the time it's still empty, right? So, so half the time, so one half the time it's, or we could say n over 2, n over 2, it's O of 1. The other half of the time, it's into the cluster, right? So half the time it's O of 1, half the time it's into the cluster. Well, when I'm into the cluster, how long does it take on average to find it? Well, it would take about, since the cluster is size n, it would take about n over 2 on average. Sometimes I find it at the beginning of the cluster. Sometimes I find it at the end of the cluster. The average is about in the middle. The average is about n over 2. Now, you might say, wait a minute, don't we have a square in here? But this is, this is the whole, poss this is all possibilities. I'd have to take this and divide by n to get the real average. So about half the time it's one probe, about half the time it's n probes, so or half the time it's n over 2 probes, so it's about n over 4 on average. So about the average number is n over 4, which is O of n, and we don't like that. So it would be good if we didn't have those big clusters. So, what about the case when we have deletions? So if I delete an item from the table with linear probing, well, let's look at an example. What could happen with this? So I can have a bunch of items, and let's say I'm not quite the worst case, but I've got Just draw my lines first. So I've got like full, 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 full. Okay. And I say, hey, I would like to delete one. All right. So let's actually, instead of check marks, just a second, I'm going to change those check marks. Try erase those really quickly without erasing all my lines. Oh, well, so much for that effort. Okay. So let's just actually put some keys in there so we can tell them apart. Like I inserted a B, C, and D. All right, so then I say, hey, let's delete A. All right, A is gone. And now I say, because I'm reading stuff in from data, I do what it says. And then someone asks, what's it, is A in there? Or even if we have a bigger hash table, you know, what values are associated with it? Really, we should be showing values associated with these. Someone says, what values associated with A? And I say, well, is A in the table? Well, let's do a hash h of a modulo m and it says so the or i should say t translation of, of a modulo m says hash function says a should be there but it's not there there's nothing there well how do i know a is not there what if i did here's a different example what if some what if i did t of c modulo m and t of c modulo m said t should be there well it's not there therefore it's not in the table no because think of it if i had inserted a b c so when i inserted a it went there when i inserted b b hashed to that hot spot i put it there and when i inserted c c said remember a is already in here i inserted everything first so a is in here so let's look at insertion so when I inserted C, the hash function said C should go there. I said, well, it can't go there. It's, it's got A in it, so let's do linear probing. Let's look at the next one. Oh, that's got B in it. Let's look at the next one. The next one is empty. Let's put C there. Then A gets removed, and someone asks us, is C in there? So when we skip over to this spot, and it's empty because we removed A, we can't just say, well, C's not in there. We have to keep looking because maybe something got removed from this cluster and maybe C is just another spot or two down, which it in fact is. So 
we would like to though let's say i did a someone says uh is e in there okay so i do t of e and modulo m and t of e says it should be here okay well that's not e i move over to c that's not it i move over and i find an empty one well do i stop looking or do i say well maybe this is a deleted one so if we delete something, we can't just delete it and call it done because now future searches, I can't stop when I find an empty spot. I have to keep searching. I have to search the entire hash table possibly. So we can't just delete it and call it done. We would have to either remove A and rehash the rest of the cluster. So we'd say, well, A is removed. And then everybody that follows it, we've got to decide, we've got to rehash them. So B stays where it is, C gets rehashed and put over here and gets deleted. But now think about what if that cluster is half the table size? What if the cluster is size M over two, and that is N, all the items are there. So now deleting the first one makes me rehash everybody else. Now removal is O of N. And I don't want removal to be O of N. I want it to be as quick as possible. So rehashing the rest of the cluster is bad. We can spend a lot of time. Do you move yes? Do you move no? Do you move yes? Ah, we'd be, we could spend a lot of time rehashing the rest of that cluster. The other way to do it would be to mark it as deleted. We could say, hey, let's mark this item as deleted and then when I say, hey, is C in there? I look at this one and it's got like a, let's put a D in the corner. It says, hey, this one has been deleted. So I know I've got to keep looking. So I move over by one, I look at B. Well, that's, it's, it's full. It's got a different key than what I'm looking for. So I move over and I find C. Ah, good, I'm done. Let's say I was searching for E. When I'm searching for E, E is supposed to be where B is, but that's not E. I move over by one, that's C, that's not E. So I move over by one and I find one that has never ever been occupied. Now I know I can stop looking because E is not in this cluster. When I find an empty one, I stop looking. So that's why we need the, if, if we're going to allow things to be removed, it's better to mark something as deleted than rehashing the whole cluster. Because once I find the one I want to delete, then finishing the delete is over one. I mark it as deleted and I'm done. But then if I don't do that, if I do, if I do the rehashing, then removal would be always O of the cluster size. Because I'd either, I'd either have to search from the end, beginning of the cluster to the end to find it, or I'd find it at the beginning and I have to rehash everyone else in the cluster. So I don't want to do that. As soon as I find it, I'd like to deletion to be done in old one time after finding the item, not having to go to the end of the cluster. So the, the deleted, the marking things as deleted is good. And also it doesn't really take extra memory because we already had to have a way to say this item in the hash table is occupied and this one is empty and has never held anything. So we still needed two possibilities. This one has something in it, this one doesn't have something in it. Now we need three possibilities. Either it has something in it right now, it has a deleted item, or it's never ever had anything in it. So we just go from three types of, uh, from two types of status to three. So we've got a new outcome when we probe. Our new outcome is we could find a deleted one. And a deleted one, an insert considers it as a place that it could do an insert. If it doesn't exist elsewhere, I'll do an example in just a minute. Search considers it occupied and keeps looking. So let's do an example of doing an insert with a deleted item. Now. The details of this are important because lab seven, you're gonna be finishing a hash table that we started. We started it, we didn't quite finish it. We got most, we got like eh, two thirds of it done, something like that. And there's like three functions or so that you have to write. 
So all the structure is there, all the functions are there, you just have to finish, like, I know you have to do insert, you've got to do square brackets, and you've got to do grow, and we'll talk about growing a hash table later. But let's look at why insert might have to look a little bit further. So let's say we've got our hash table and I've got one. Okay, so there's my different buckets. And I say, hey, let's insert A. Okay, so A goes here and I say insert B. B was supposed to go there, but we bumped it over by one. We say insert C. Well, C is supposed to go where uh, a is, but we get bumped over, we get bumped over, so C goes here. Now, let's say we remove A. Okay, so we remove A and we mark this one, let's change colors, we mark this one as deleted. Now, it's obvious which ones are empty and which ones are full. We need to mark, the, just visually, we just need to mark the deleted ones. Okay, so that one's been deleted. Now, someone says, so we basically said insert, we said insert A, insert B, insert C. Then we said remove A. And now someone says insert C. Well, we hash C and it says, well, here's where C should go. And it's deleted. Well, I can't just insert C if I'm not allowing duplicates. If I'm not allowing duplicates, I can't just insert a C here. I've got to move over and say, well, wait a minute. Well, C might be part of a cluster. There's a deleted item here. Maybe C got bumped in the past. So I would have to keep looking. And I'd probe here, probe here, probe here, and say, oh, look, C's already in there. I can't insert it. Done. All right. Now, someone says, I would like to insert A. So we do a hash of A and we look and we see a deleted item. When you see that D, you don't look at the data because it's been deleted. So we look there, we see it's deleted, we don't, it's, and we say, well, A could have gotten bumped. Maybe B or C, you know, was here and got deleted and A had to be inserted further on. So I've got to keep looking for A. So I keep looking for A. Oh, wait, I'm going to, oh, let's do something else. I'm going to make this a better example. Let's say we did a, before we did insert A, we did a remove B. Okay, so B is deleted also. So I'd say, well, that's deleted. I got to keep looking, right? I'm inserting A. So I look at C, C is full. So I look here and I say, hey, that one, hey, look at that one. That one is empty. I'm at the end of the cluster. And now I can go back to the first deleted one and put it there. And remembering the first deleted one could be good. What if I had something like, I have to have a different hash table. What if I had a hash table where I've got a bunch of items and I've got, okay. So I've got a bunch of full ones. I've got like A, B, C, D, E, deleted. Oops. So I've got a, a B, C, D, E, deleted one, deleted one, deleted one, and then an empty one. And I say, hey, I'd like to insert Q. And Q is supposed to go here. Well, it can't go there, so I move over to E, I move over to there, I move over, I find deleted one, I find deleted one, I find an empty one. Well, now, if I had remembered where the first deleted one was, I could say, hey, I found an empty one. Q's not in this cluster. I go to the first deleted one, and bam, I just put it in that first deleted one. So that's why remembering the deleted one is good, because I already had to look through them to find the empty one to know Q isn't in this cluster. But if I'm, while I'm doing that, I remember the first empty one. I don't have to start over from C is full, D is full, E is full. Hey, here's a deleted one. So we can, we can save some time there. So when we want to do this, if we, if we started out and we just had a bool for like, it's got something in it or it doesn't. When we 
add the deleted state, we could use one option would be to have a second bool. Now a second bool is confusing because I've got booleans for full or empty and I've got a boolean for deleted or not. So I've got a boolean for is it full and I've got a boolean for is it empty. I've got four combinations but only three of them make sense. And someone reading it might be wondering, well, what does it mean to be deleted but empty? Or empty is true, but deleted is... Wait, which, which of the three makes sense? So using two Booleans is a bad idea because it's confusing to anyone else reading your code. A better idea would be to use an enumerated type. Now, you've started to see these for Project 3. Project 3, the table entry class, uses it. It's got an enumerated type called entry type. And you should be using it for your own to remember like your vector of column types. So you've got to remember, you've got to have some way to remember what the type of each column is. So we've got to have some type of container that remembers the types of the columns. You may as well use entry type. You do not want to use strings for the type of the column because they are slow to compare. To know whether the string double is equal to the string double takes Am I at the end? Am I at the end? Is D equal to D? Increment, increment. Am I at the end? No, no. Is O equal to O? No, no. Move forward, move forward. It takes six operations per character. So that's 18 operations to compare them. And then another two operations to discover I'm at the end of them, or one or two, depending on how it's coded. So like 20 operations to find whether double is equal to double. Enums, that would have been one comparison to compare the enumerated value double to the enumerated value double is one comparison. So that's why we don't want to use strings for the column types. Sure, we read them in as strings, but we want to remember them as this enumerated type. So here's an example with our enumerated type for our um, Excuse me, <clears throat> our enumerated type for our hash table. So we say, hey, this is the type of this bucket, or really I can say not type of the bucket, status would be a better, maybe slightly better word. So what is the status of this bucket? It's either empty, it's never held anything, it's occupied, it holds something right now, or it's deleted. It used to hold something in the past and it doesn't anymore. So then later on, so that's how we create an enumerated type. We could also add one other thing in here to cut to potentially cut down on our memory. We can say colon something like char here, or we could put uint eight underscore t. I think that's what the entry type uses in project three starter file is a uint eight t. Either way, it's basically saying make sure this thing only takes up one byte of memory, either a character or a one byte integer. So we can add that in to make sure we, we keep our space to a minimum. And later on, um, let's assuming that every bucket of the hash table had a dot bucket type, had a dot type is, is part of it. So then I can write code like if buckets sub i dot type equals equals bucket type colon colon empty. We have to use the qualified name to get at the enum class values. So I can use those types in if statements. I can use those types in assignments. Like if I got rid of the if parentheses and change that to one equal sign and put a semicolon here, I can do an assignment with these. Um, and then when we, we can use them in ifs, we can use them in switches and cases. So we would switch on the variable type. The case would be bucket type colon colon occupied, and we would have multiple switch statements. We'd have a case occupied, and remember the case would be followed by a break, and then we'd have another case statement, etc. So we'd have case code break, case code break, case code break, and we could have a default. It shouldn't ever ever happen, 
that we get a, we get something other than those three. But you know, coding for safety, we might code it that way with four with a default case, and it just says it's not case default. It's just default colon is the is the last one, and it does have to be last. And that's sort of like an if else if else if else. It's like the trailing else. If it wasn't one of the ones you already knew, then go here. And we can put like an, an error message and an exit there. So this is how we could do it in our hash table and how you're going to have to do it for the lab because we've already created the enumerated types, etc. So what we want to look at is if we do open addressing and there's collisions occurring, how many probes does it take to get a hit, to find the key I'm looking for, or to get a miss, which could be what I'm looking for. Like if I'm trying to insert, I'm looking for a miss. I'm trying to find an open spot to put this thing. So if I'm trying to search, a hit is good. If I'm trying to insert, a hit is okay. It means it's already in the table and I don't have to insert it. A miss is good too when I'm trying to insert something. It means, hey, I found an empty spot. It can go here. Now the formulas here, we're not going to derive them. You don't have to memorize them. We're not going to come back to these formulas again on the exam. Maybe on the lab, I don't remember, but not on, not on the exam. But what we want you to take away from it is the basic what this table looks like. So this table is saying, hey, I've got different load factors, and I want to know how many probes does it take to find something if it's in the hash table, how many probes does it take to discover it's not in the hash table? Or, which is equivalent to saying, how long does it take to insert a new one? Because I have to find an empty spot if I'm inserting a new one. So those two different formulas from the previous slide say that if it's in there and you go looking for it, it'll take uh, about, let's say the hash table is half full, about one and a half probes. But if we let the hash table get up to 90% full, it'll take five and a half probes just to find if something is in there or not. Now, what about, let's look at inserting a new one. I say, hey, let's insert a new one, and I need to find an open location. Well, if the hash table is half full, it takes me about two and a half probes. If the table is 90% full, it takes me about 50 probes. Now, notice... The size of the table isn't in here. So this is for like an arbitrarily large n. For some arbitrarily large n, it could still take like 50 probes to insert a new one if the table is 90% full. So the takeaway from this is if my hash table does open addressing, and, and specifically linear probing, if my hash table does linear probing, I'm not too bad if it's if the hash table's half full. But if I let it go too far past half full, look at this, just going from 0.5 to 0.7, this more than doubles the time to insert. So we don't want to let the table get up to like three quarters full, would maybe be three, four times to insert a new one. Maybe four times uh, that. So. So if we, if we stick to about half full, we're pretty good. If we let it get too much beyond that with linear probing, the performance starts to degrade. Inserting new ones takes longer. Searching for existing ones takes longer. So we don't want the table to get too, too full. That's what the, the important takeaway from this slide is, is that half full is a decent place to be. Now with Quadratic probing. So this is our, we're moving on to a new collision resolution scheme. Still open addressing, but we're going to do quadratic probing. The idea of quadratic probing is, hey, let's not look at adjacent squares over and over again. That makes one cluster bigger, right? If I do linear probing, if I do start to get a cluster, anytime I hit anywhere in the beginning of the cluster, or even, I don't even hash to the beginning of the cluster, I hash three or four spots in, but that's now part of the cluster. I just make this cluster bigger. So quadratic probing tries to overcome this by saying, don't skip forward by j, skip forward by j squared. 
So that allows us to say, hey, I'll look at the next one, but if that one's also occupied, I'm not going to move two from the beginning. I'm going to move four from the beginning. And notice, this is critical, it is you move from the original hash plus j squared, not from where we were plus j squared, from the original plus j squared. And of course, we always have to do the modulo m to make sure we have a valid index. So we take the translation plus j squared and modulo m. So if skipping over by one was still occupied, let's skip over by four from the original location. Let's skip over by nine from the original location. And that tries to not make the one cluster bigger. It tries to make a new smaller cluster. That's the idea of quadratic probing. Now, when we resolve collisions with quadratic probing, we get different, even uglier formulas. But let's look at what happens here. When we've got a successful search, uh, so this was linear probing, so we've repainted the slide here. Oh, wait, whoops, sorry. Nope, quadratic probing. I'm misreading. <laughs> okay, so with quadratic probing, we've got 1.44 and 2.19. What I was doing is I was looking back and on my PC to find the earlier numbers. So the earlier numbers for linear were 1.5 and 2.5. So we've made, we improved the successful search a little bit, but we, we improved the unsuccessful search by even more. So small increase 0 0.06, 0 0.06 out of 1.5 is one, a little over 120, so about 5%-ish, 4%-ish, something like that. But this one is, is a little bit bigger. It's about one-eighth or about a little less than one-eighth, so about 12%. So we went from about 4% improvement to about 12% improvement. So not too bad. There is one problem, though, with quadratic probing. With quadratic probing, you really, really don't want to go beyond half full. It's bad. Because, let's do a little example. Um, I say, hey, I'd like to hash something, and let's make a hash table here. Okay, so I've got seven buckets. All right. And I say, hey, let's hash uh, a key so let's have let's insert uh, key one. Okay, so I insert key one, and it's supposed to go to. I do the translation and the modulo, and it says go to index two. Okay, so I go to index two, and I put key one there, and I insert key two, and it also says go. To, it says go to index three. Okay, so I put key two there at index three. Zero, one two. And I insert, let's say, key four, or key, sorry, key three, and it says go to index two. So I go to index two, that's full. I go to index three, that one's full. Uh, I go to index six, two plus, so the original two plus four would be six, and I put K3 here. Okay, I'm good. Okay, let's insert K, key four. And that one says go to index two also. So I check index two, that's full. So I go to three, whoops, that one should say two, three, six. So I did two, three, six for that one. So this one goes to two and then to three, and then it goes to six and that one's full. Okay, so then I go to two plus nine is 11. 11 modulo seven is four, right? Okay, so we got 2 plus 9, 11, 11 modulo 7 is 4. It says go to index 4. And there we go. So key 4 goes there. All right, so now I say insert key 5. And it, I'm unlucky, key 5 also says go to index 2. So I try 2, I try 3, I try 6, I try 4. Then I would look at, uh, I'm up to my fourth probe, right? So that would be 16. 16 plus 2 is 18. 18 modulo 7 uh, is 4. 
Okay, how about uh, 25? 25 plus 2 is 27. 27 modulo 7 is 6. Okay, that, nope. Okay, how about uh, 36? 36, 38. 38 modulo 7 is 3. Oh, that's occupied. Um, okay, 49 plus 2 is 51. 51 modulo 7 is 2. Nope. Um, 64 plus 2 is 66. Modulo 7 is 3. Nope. We got a problem. It's referred to as residual squares. What it means is that when you square a number, it can only take on certain, uh, or if you square a number and you do modulo anything, even the fact that we had a prime table size didn't help. If you take a number squared, modulo anything, and it could be a number squared like j squared plus a constant, it doesn't matter, and we take it modulo anything, there are a limited number of possibilities of the remainder. If you go beyond 50% full, this can happen. So if the table size was even, 50% would be okay. But as soon as you move beyond 50%, residual squares can happen. And then the numbers in this slide beyond here go out the window if you get residual squares occurring. So we got to be careful. If we do quadratic probing, we don't want to go beyond half full. Bad things can happen. So quadratic probing does cut down things down, but we just got to be really careful we don't do uh, too full of a, a load factor. Next idea, double hashing. So the idea of double hashing is, again, we want to spread out our collisions. We don't want to just go plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. That's bad. So what we do here is we have a new function. So we make a new second hashing function. And what we do is we take that second hashing function and we multiply it by j. So instead of, think of it this way. Linear probing was j times 1. Quadratic probing was j times j. Double hashing is j times some new function. So we take this new function, and the idea of the new function is to try to spread things out again. So we've got an example here of a, of a secondary hashing function, t prime, that does a decent job, actually. So it takes the t of key, the original translation of the original key, modulo q, then it takes Q minus that whole thing, and that is our secondary hash function. So it, Q has to be a prime number, and it has to be less than the table size. Because if it, if it happens to be a, uh, the, if the table size is, is smaller than that, then we, we could just wrap around and hit things again. So we pick a prime number. It doesn't have to be a huge prime number, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to skip by some prime factorization away multiplied by j. It's still deterministic, right? Remember Professor Darden said last time, it's got to be deterministic. It's got to generate the same sequence every time. And this is deterministic, but it's hard to predict. So because it's hard to predict, it makes it more likely to not have collisions. And so the we don't have formulas for this one of how good does it do, because it really depends on this t prime function. But you could go through and make a table and run through it and see what happens with this exact function. How does it do on, on the uh, collisions and no average number of probes for a successful search and for a miss? Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is dynamic hashing. The idea of dynamic hashing is, hey, my table is too full. For whatever hashing scheme I've got, I have reached a point where my load factor is high enough that I've got to make the table bigger. So as my keys increase, my alpha increases. As alpha increases, my performance decreases. With separate chaining, the nice thing about separate chaining is it's uh, the search time increases basically gradually and, and linearly with the length of the chains. 
So if the average, if the length of the average chain is one, then it takes me on average one probe. And if the length of the average chain is two, it takes two. And if the length of the average chain is three, it takes three. So even if my separate chain, even if my load factor is three, that just means I'm searching linked lists who have an average length of three. But there could be in there, there could be linked lists of length zero and linked lists of length six or seven or 10. So really, even with separate chain, we don't want alpha to become too big. There's a point at which we don't like it anymore. And um, we, we, have to, we have to grow the hash table. With linear probing, remember uh, linear probing, so I want to remember which slide I'm on, 25. Remember with linear probing, if we get too far past half, this search time starts to significantly increase. And we don't want that to happen. So we reach a point where we say, hey, alpha is, is too big now. I've got to rehash. I've got to grow the hash table. So to grow the hash table, what we have to do is, hey, let's, let's play like a vector does. When the load factor is too big, it is too full. And what we do is let's double the size of the, of the hash table. And then what we've got to do is we've got to take every item and rehash it. Unlike a vector, see when a vector grows, I've got, you know, the first four are full, so I make a new vector of size eight and I copy these over to indices zero, one, two, three. I just copy them to the same indices. But with a hash table, I have to rehash every item. So let's say I had a hash table of size four, and I decide that it's too full because it's got two items in it. So I grow to a hash table of size eight, now, I had two items in here. I had key one and key two. Now, what happened was T of key one was equal to one and T of key two was equal to five. But when we did modulo four, they both went to index one and key two got bumped. But when I rehash, when I grow the hash table, I don't just copy them to index one and two, I rehash them and key one goes to index one again, but key two ends up at index five. And now I've broken up the cluster. The cluster was really just a side effect of the size of the hash table. So we've got to take, basically we've, we've got to allocate a new one. We've got to look at everyone in the old one who is occupied. Deleted ones we ignore, empty ones we ignore. But we get everyone over to the new hash table. There's a side benefit to this. These may be, maybe I had over here in this old hash table, I happen to have deleted and deleted. I wasn't just 50% full, I was 100% non-empty. So if I wanted to search for key three, if key three, no matter where it searched, I had to go all the way around back to my starting location. And I had to notice that. I can't loop forever. I can't say, ooh, I stop when I find an empty one. I've got to stay, I stop when I find an empty one, or I wrap around to my beginning, and now I know, hey, the whole table is either full or deleted. The benefit now is that in my new hash table, there are no deleted ones. Everybody is either empty or occupied. And now I can deallocate that old container, and now I use this container. And when you implement this, think about what you can do with vectors. Think about swap. When you do lab seven and you do the rehash and grow function, you're gonna to have to do this. You're gonna to have to allocate a new vector that's twice as big as the old one. You're gonna to have to get things from the old one to the new one. And you're gonna to have to, at some point, swap the old one with the new one. Because you've got a member variable called buckets. You've got a temporary vector in the rehash and grow that is gonna disappear. And so what we can do is we, can, we don't want to make a copy, then resize the original and then rehash everything. Too much work. I want to say, hey, make a new one that's bigger 
and then at some point I'm going to swap them and I'm going to get every I'm going to get everything into the new one and then when I'm done the temp vector disappears that's my old one and swapping two vectors is o of 1 swapping two vectors is o of 1 because it swaps pointers it swaps sizes it swaps capacities basically it swaps pointers swap size t swap size t done it's o of 1 so it still takes O of n time to copy n items over from the old one to the new one to rehash the, the occupied ones from the old one to the new one, but I don't have to spend extra time on the vectors. So this is going to be expensive to do, but it's not going to happen that often. So if we look at the amortized analysis, we can't guarantee that every operation is fast, but we can guarantee the average cost per operation is going to be low. The total cost is low, but the performance profile is spiky. So what I'm going to do is, oh, so we've got, we've got these slides talking about it. Um, there's, another, there's another example here of like how this works. Think of it, think of amortized analysis in this way. When you insert, that costs time, right? Let's say that every time we did an insert, we also put some time in the time bank, a constant amount of time. So I paid a constant amount of time to finish the insert, and I also deposited some constant amount of time into a time bank. Then the first ones where I don't have to grow, I'm building up a balance. I'm building up a balance of time. And then when I do the one that, hey, I'm about to go to half full. I don't like half full. Half full is bad. Let's grow it. So I grow it by doubling, etc. So I'm faced with now a big bill, right? It's going to take time to take everybody and rehash them. But I also have a, I have a balance in my time bank to spend. So if everybody that did an insert spent twice as much time putting because they put extra time in the time bank. So instead of every insert taking O of 1, it took O of 2. O of 1 time to do it, and O of 1 got deposited. When it's time to rehash them, they've already paid for their rehashing. So the, so the time to grow the table is constant plus what people have already paid. Which means everybody, basically, everybody, every insert took twice as long. On average, every insert took twice as long. This is just a different view of it, of how amortized analysis, just how to view amortized analysis. So with this one specifically, what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, we've got to make an assumption about the probing method to know what the costs are going to be. So we said, let's assume it was linear probing and we had to grow it. And that's actually what you're going to do in lab. You're going to do linear probing. You're going to grow when it's approximately half full. You can grow when it's surpassing half full. You can grow when it touches half full. It doesn't matter. The auto grader for this is actually stupendous on um, grading you correctly, even if you do it different than us. So you just have to grow when it's about half full. So we said, okay, so let's, let's say we've got a table of size M. And I've got a table that is half full. Or to get there, sorry. To get there, I had to insert m over 2 minus 1 keys. So every one of those needed to find an empty spot. Finding an empty spot comes from this column. But no one in there costed more than 2.5 on average. Like the very first insert, hey, everything's empty. I insert it's O of 1. But after that, maybe I get a collision, maybe I don't. But the average cost after that never exceeds 2.5 because it's never more than half full. So the average cost is less than or equal to 2.5 to get the table up to the point where it's just almost half full. So it's almost half full and someone says, do an insert. And I say, oh, do an insert. That would put me at half full. I would like to rehash and grow before I hit that 50%. Whether you do it before you hit it or after you hit it, it's not a big deal. Just do it at some point close to half. So here, when I insert the m over 2 
the key m over 2. <laughs> when I insert the key number m over 2, I make a new table, size 2m. Now I have to take everyone. It says remove here, but really I'm just going to take them and insert them into the new one. So I'm going to do basically an insert operation, right? I have to take this thing that is occupied in the old one, and I have to do an insert into the new one. Well, the insert into the new one, in the new one, the new table is never more than a quarter full, right? I had a table that was half full. The new one can't be more than a quarter full. And if we go back in, sorry, sorry, I forgot to change slides there. So I just know this. So we we when we insert them into the table, we're inserting them into this new table of size 2M. It's never more than a quarter full. And so what I did was there was no quarter full row, but I took the 0.3 full row. So it was never more than 1.5. So it's never more than 1.5 to insert them into the new one. So it cost me O of M to get the first M over two minus one. It cost me O of M to rehash and grow. Well, O of M plus O of M is O of M. It's still linear time to insert the first M over two. It's just that the last one had a spike in its cost compared to the others. The others were all constant time. This one was bigger, but overall, over all those operations, those, all those M operations, it took me basically 2M time to do M inserts is approximately the cost of two per insert. So it cost me about two operations per insert. So it's a constant time still amortized. If we do enough inserts where the table grows and then it gets half full and it grows again, it gets half full and it grows again, gets half full, it grows again, those amortized costs are constant. Each, each one looks like about an average cost of a constant amount. So that's, again, this is assuming that we don't like have a terrible hash function like zero. If the hash function just returns zero, then all this is going to go badly because everything is going to be a collision. But if our hash function is decent and the number of collisions is not terrible, not everything, then we're going to get some collisions, we're going to get a good amount of misses, and we're going to get constant cost inserts, constant cost searches, constant cost removals. Okay, so we've got a demo here, and I've got to change screens because I've got mine loaded up into Visual Studio already. And just a second, change my, where's my OBS software? Okay, so I gotta say, I want my, we wanna see the output also. I'm gonna have to go full desktop. You're gonna see infinite recursion here for a second, and then we'll go over to Visual Studio, okay. So let's just run this program and see what it does. Okay, so it says the value associated with my name is zero. I added it to the table. Oh, well then the value associated with my name is 123.4. I remove it from the table and I look up the value associated with my name. It's zero again. Now wait a minute, let's look at the code in main. It says, okay, so I create an empty hash table. I say get get the value associated with David Paoletti. Well, that get said zero, but it wasn't in the table. But getting it forced it to exist. This is like square brackets. And in fact, later on, there's going to be a square brackets operation. So I insert, I say add David Paoletti with the value 123.4, and I do a get, it says 123.4. I say remove it. What's the value? The value is zero because if it doesn't exist, it must exist. Okay, what about testing? I square brackets testing. Okay, subscript testing is, subscript testing is zero. I look up, I square brackets testing. If it doesn't exist, it must exist. So my simple hash table, it does not have a find with an iterator. It has a get that gets the value associated with a key and it's got square brackets, which basically does the same thing. It's got an insert that if the key already exists, it updates the value. Pretty simple.
I clear the whole table. I do square brackets testing. I get the value zero because, well, looking it up with square brackets makes it exist. And this is, the square brackets at least is exactly how the STL works. When you want something to exist, you square brackets it. Now, let's look at how I made this happen. So this is hash table dot h. So hash table dot h, we include a linked hash list. We'll look at that in a minute. We got a description up here. We've got a template. So it's template type on the key type, the value type, and the hash type. So you have to give me a hash function, and I'll remember it. I'll make a member variable of the hasher, and then I'll use it. I've got a hash table of size 251. This one does not have a rehash and grow. I didn't write it for you. You got to do that for lab seven. So this one has a fixed table whose size is a prime. Okay. It says, note, there's no destructor. In fact, there's no constructor. The default constructor makes a, a linked an array of linked hash lists. And when it's done, the array gets destroyed. All the linked lists get their destructors called automatically. Take care of itself. All right, so no destructor needed for the table. The ha linked hash list, different issue. So it says, hey, I'd like to add something. I'd like to add this key value pair. Well, let's see what the hash function says. We take the hash function, modulo the table size, that gives me an address. And I just go to that address and I say, hey, linked list, linked hash list, call your add function. Make it happen. Here's a key value pair, make it happen. All right, what about... Uh, Remove, same thing, compute the index, call the remove function on the linked list. Okay, what about getting? Same thing, compute the index, call the linked list dot get, square brackets. I've got an overloaded operator square brackets that returns a value type reference, same as get, same exact code as get. It just says, look up the, in, the square brackets of that key, call that linked hash lists get function. And then the hash table has a clear function. The hash table clear function says, run through every linked list and call its clear function. So really, all the work is in the linked hash list. Linked hash list has, okay, so every node, see there's no hash function here. This is just a linked list. Every node has a key and a value. Those are the, the uh, parameter, the template types. And then we've got a pointer to the next list node. So this list node, so I've got a list node is a struct. It's got a constructor. So it's got a constructor that says, hey, you want to create a key value and a next. And oh, look at this, our friend, the default parameter. So if someone only gives you a key and a value, you assume that they want the next pointer to be a null pointer. If they do give you one, you use whatever they said. So I initialize my member variables using the initialization syntax. Then the body of my constructor is done. Destructor. we got to have a destructor. Destructor of a list node says delete next. It says implicit destruction. When we go back to the slides, I'll draw this out, what happens here. This is really cool and really powerful. So... We've got a, so I had a, so this is my class. My class has private stuff, a structure, and it's got a private head pointer to the head of the linked list. It's got a constructor, says, hey, constructor, set the head to a null pointer with initialization syntax and you're done. Destructor says, call delete on the head. And it'll go from there. We're going to draw this out in a few minutes when we get back to the tablet. Just remember what happened. So linked list delete says delete head. When the head, when the node gets deleted, it says delete next. All right, let's look at the other things. Now, really, it does have a comment here. Really, this thing is incomplete. We should have a copy constructor and an operator equals. So because the, the hash table dot H is the only one that uses it, and it doesn't do anything wrong, I skipped them. But really, we sh if someone used this in something else, we shouldn't really skip these. We should go implement them. But anyway, I wanted to get to the add and remove and get. So add says, hey, add a node to the linked list. If the key is not in the list, it's added at the head of the linked list. If the key is already in the list, the value is updated. 
So this does have, this linked list does have unique keys. It does not allow duplicate keys. So we say, while I've got, so start at the head, while I've got a valid pointer, this is the same as saying, well, pointer is not equal, or well, pointer is not equal to a null pointer. If it's not a null pointer, check the key. If the key is a match, then update the value and you're done. Otherwise, move to the next. So if we ever find the we're adding something that already exists, we update the value and we're done. If we get out of the while loop, meaning we got a null pointer, we know it's not in there, we say, hey, set the head equal to a new node. The new node will be the key value we want to insert and the old head. Remember, this side has to resolve before the assignment can happen. So we take the old head of the linked list becomes the new head's next pointer. Remember, our list node constructor has a pointer to the next. So that's the, de the default next is going to be the old head. So it adds this new one at the new head. The old head becomes the next in this one's chain. Okay, remove says, I'm going to need some pointers. If the list is empty, do nothing. That was basically to avoid a uh, seg fault. So then if, and we need a special case here, because if the head is the key, we have to change the head. If it's some other node, we've got to change somebody's next pointer. So if it was the head of the linked list, or if there was no linked list, we got a special case. If it's the head of the linked list, we got a special case. Else, we've got to go through the linked list. So we remember who's the head, point the real head to the next, say this one has this node that I'm going to delete has no next in it. This is important because of the delete, and then we delete the node pointer. If we skip this line, if we comment that out, it'll destroy the whole linked list because of that implicit destruction. Whenever you delete a node pointer, it deletes next. So that's why we've got to com we can't comment this out. We got to set the node pointer next to a null pointer, otherwise we'd kill the rest of the linked list. Then it says, okay, it's in. It might be in there. I know it's not an empty list. I know it's not at the head. It might be in there. So let's start at the head. Well, that's not a null pointer, and we haven't found the key. Move our. We've got basically two pointers: previous pointer and node pointer. Previous node pointer catches up, node pointer moves to next, and then if I get out of that loop and I have a node pointer, then I know I do have a real node that needs deleting. We do what we did before, we route around it. We say, hey, old previous, you point to my next. Whether it's a null pointer or not, I don't care. You point to whoever my next is. I don't have a next, I get deleted. And then get, Git is pretty is uh, kind of similar to both of those. It says, hey, if it's in there, update the uh, return the value. So return a reference to the value. If it's not in there, so we try to find it. So this is the finding part. So we try to find it. If we find it, we return the value by reference. And then they get to change the value associated with the key. Otherwise, we move on. So we try to find it. If we never find it, we create a new one at the head. So we say, hey, let's create a new node. Let's let the old head be its next. And here is how the default value happens. We say value type parentheses. This thing will not work if value type doesn't have a default constructor. It's got to have one. So we create an anonymous variable of this value type, immediately give it to the new list node, shove it into the linked list at the head, head next points to the old head, and we return the value that we just inserted. We know we added at the head, so we know we can just return head value. And clear just deletes the head and sets it to a null pointer. Okay, let me go back to OBS for a second. Got to go back to lecture mixed, and we're almost done here. So the how the deletion occurs, we have summary slides. So how the deletion occurs, remember, I've got head, which points to a node, which has a next, which points to a node, which has a next, which points to a node, which has a next, which points to a node, which has a null pointer. 
So the implicit destruction, when you delete, so if I just have one node, like temp, temp points to a node and the node has an, a null pointer for next. If I delete that node, the deleting the node says delete next and delete next point, a null pointer does nothing. But when we delete the head of the linked list, when clear says delete head, delete head calls the destructor on the node, which calls delete next, right? So I'm in the node destructor, which says delete next, which calls the node destructor. It is implicit, meaning you didn't have to specify that it would delete everything, but it did. And it is deleting the entire linked list tail recursively. Basically, the destructor, you're not allowed to call destructors yourself. That's a bad thing. But when the destructor calls delete, the thing that delete calls does is, and then that's the end of the function, right? Delete calls the destructor on the node, which is what's running right now. So it reuses the stack frame to call delete. And basically every node gets killed in the entire linked list one after another with using only one stack frame. It's really, really cool. If you had known this, you could have maybe done this in pairing heap. You could have said, my pairing heap nodes have a destructor. The, the node destructor says delete child, delete sibling. And then your destructor would just say delete head. You wouldn't even need a special case for a null pointer. You just say, hey, if it's a null pointer, whoosh, it's not tail recursive because there's one. One has to happen before the other. But if you've got a decent pairing heap that is not a huge big stick, it'll work. It won't over, it won't overflow the stack. I've tried it. So if we'd known this back then, we could have done it. Oh well, too late now. So last slide here, just summary. Remember, we've got separate chaining is different from all of these. All of those are called the open addressing. So separate chaining is different from all the others that use open addressing. Dynamic hashing can be applied to any of the four. Eventually, no matter what method you've got, you're going to have a point where, hey, my, my hash table's too full, I've got to grow it by doubling, etc. Now, if you want to know what does the STL do, stick around for one more minute. So what the STL's unordered map does, at least the version that I looked at, is it starts out an empty hash table is size 8. They didn't want to make it 0 because they didn't want to have to grow by doubling too many times. It basically goes empty hash table is size 8, then when it's half full it goes to 64, then it goes to 512, and then it doubles after that. They just didn't want to rehash and grow too many times when the hash table is small, and they found through testing that not many people use uh, small hash tables. And so the wasted space isn't too big of a deal because most hash tables are bigger than that. Also, the STL uses separate chaining. They did separate chaining because they wanted something to happen. They wanted hash table iterators to persist. Even if the ha if you've got a hash table, if you do a find on something and then you insert something and grow the hash table, that iterator that you did the find on is still valid. That iterator is still valid until the item it points to gets deleted. So if you don't delete it, you can grow the hash table, shrink it, add and remove other things. It doesn't matter. This iterator is always valid because it's basically the iterator in an STL standard unordered map and unordered set, the iterator is basically a linked list node pointer. And the node never moves. It stays in memory somehow. Someone else might link to it, it might have a different next, but the node itself stays where it was created. And that was their goal. They wanted iterators to be valid the whole way through. Is it the most efficient? No. If you look at someplace like um, Google has a Google template library. They have, at least the last I heard, 
three different hash tables beyond standard unordered map. They've got three hash tables with varying degrees of features and speed. The more features you have, the less speed. So you can pick the one with the features you want with the best, with the best, most often hitting all of one behavior, etc. Okay, so that's it for today for lecture. We're going to call it done here, and then we will see you in Prof's Hours after some lunchtime.